Okay, awesome. Uh, super excited to be here, everybody. Today, uh, as you can see here, we're going to be talking about what actually is WebAssembly. And we're really going to be doing a deep dive kind of into the guts and internals of WebAssembly. So I'm really excited to talk to everybody here. A uh, little bit about myself. My name's Caleb Shep. I'm a software engineer at a startup called Fermion. Uh, Fermion's been around for about two years, and I've been there for about a year myself. Um, and we have two projects that we kind of, uh, well, let me back up. What does Fermion do? Uh, Fermion actually works to help build serverless uh, applications using WebAssembly. And we have two projects that we primarily use to do that. So the first is Spin, which is our open source project that allows you to build serverless apps using WebAssembly. And then the second is Fermion Cloud, which is our opinionated solution for hosting those uh, WebAssembly apps. I spend most of my time working on the Fermion Cloud, and so that's kind of my background here. Um, but I do also spend some time contributing up upstream to, to the Spin project. Um, enough about myself, though. Let's dive right in. I want to start kind of just with a high-level overview of maybe the things you're hearing about WebAssembly in the popular media. Um, and then later in the talk, for the rest of it, we're going to really dive in and try and understand from first principles what's going on under the hood. Um, but before I go too far, can I get a raise of hands for anybody who hasn't heard of WebAssembly before? OK, fantastic. Everybody here in the room has heard of WebAssembly. So, I imagine you're, you're probably hearing all sorts of things. You're probably hearing that WebAssembly is really popular right now. You're probably hearing about it in blog posts, medium articles, YouTube videos. You likely have come across this crazy verbose textbook definition of WebAssembly. We're not going to read that today, but my hope is by the end of this talk, you'd be able to parse this and break down what that actually means. You've likely heard that WebAssembly can be abbreviated as WASM, and you'll catch me using them interchangeably throughout the talk. You've also probably heard that despite the name being WebAssembly, it's being used all over the place. So of course in the browser with a name like that, but it's also being used for serverless functions, plugin architectures, in embedded use cases, blockchain, database, uh, the list goes on. There's major adoption of WebAssembly across lots of companies. Um, these are just a few of the companies adopting it. And then lastly, when you hear people like me or, or other people talking about WebAssembly, you probably hear us talking about four kind of terms that we're constantly bandying about. So I want to break them down. Uh, the first one is people are always talking about the security of WebAssembly, how it's a sandboxed execution environment. Uh, we're going to talk in a bit about what that actually looks like in practice. Secondly, people are always talking about the performance of WebAssembly, how it offers near-native execution speed. Third, people say WebAssembly is polyglot. What does that mean? Poly, many, glot languages. It means you can work in multiple different programming languages to target WebAssembly. And then fourth, people are always talking about the portability that WebAssembly gives you. Not just cross-platform portability, so different operating systems or, or domains and use cases, but also cross-architecture, so x86, ARM, RISC-V, things like that. So th this is what we're hearing about WebAssembly in the media, what, you know, the kind of the hype cycle of WebAssembly. But what's actually going on under the hood? That's what I want to talk about here. That's what the rest of the presentation is, breaking that open. But just before we do that, I think this is a really important slide. I can spend the next 25 minutes teaching you guys what a bytecode is and talking about this and that. But I think if we don't tie it back to these kind of four properties that we're really excited about, it's all kind of meaningless. Um, so with the help of some very cheesy animations, I admit they're cheesy, but spin effects are fun. Um, Anytime you see one of these stamps flying onto the screen, I'm going to be calling back to one of these things and kind of tying the underlying concept to one of these things we care about. OK, so at the most basic level, what is WebAssembly? WebAssembly is just another bytecode format. If anybody in here has worked with Java before, then you're probably familiar with that. So if you have your Java program, you want to run it. You don't directly compile it to machine code that you can execute. You compile it to this intermediate Java bytecode. And then that Java bytecode can then be executed by the Java virtual machine. Now, of course, this Java virtual machine can be made to run on different architectures, ARM x86. Um, WebAssembly follows kind of this exact architecture. So with WebAssembly, you take your program, you compile it to an intermediate form, a WebAssembly or WASM bytecode in this case, and then you use a WebAssembly runtime to actually execute that WebAssembly. Again, same story where that runtime can run on different architectures. Now, there's two things I immediately want to point out about this kind of architecture, things we get out of the box. The first 
is that we get this kind of polyglot programming out of the box, inherent to the design that you can take any program in, in, in a language that supports WebAssembly and compile to this single intermediate format. Um, Java, of course, kind of started this story of polyglot programming. You can take Java and Scala and Kotlin and things like that to compile to Java bytecode. Um, but WebAssembly really kind of opens up the breadth of that, the amount of language support. Second thing I want to highlight here is the, the portability, specifically the cross-architecture portability we get out of the box. So just by being able to compile to a single intermediate format and then just have a few different runtimes that work on all the different architectures, we're getting that portability out of the box. Again, this story of like write once, run anywhere was kind of started by Java, but is in some ways continued by, by WebAssembly. Now, the rest of the talk is going to be talking about the three parts here. How do we get our code into WebAssembly? What does WebAssembly actually look like, those, that, that bytecode? And then how do you execute that WebAssembly? Um, but where I want to start is in the middle with, with that WebAssembly bytecode. So a, a single file, a single discrete uh, unit of, of WebAssembly bytecode is considered a WASM module. That's what we call it. And so this is the heart of it all, and we're going to really crack that open. So there's two representations to a WebAssembly module. The first representation is the binary format. Uh, on, on disk, it's got the extension .wasm, and this is what you're going to be seeing in the wild. If you're you know, cracking open a website and they're using WebAssembly or for Fermion serverless functions, things like that, you're going to be seeing the WASM file because it's the most compact representation. Um, I don't know about you guys. I have not yet developed the capability to look at bytes and understand what they mean. So thankfully, they gave us another format called the text format. And this is a completely equivalent format that represents the same module, but in a textual form that you can kind of parse as a human. In practice, people aren't writing WebAssembly modules by hand. That'd be terrible work, and I would never want to do that. Um, but it's useful for learning, and it's also useful for the compiler engineers targeting WebAssembly for debugging. Um, the, just as a note, the, the extension for a text version WebAssembly module would be Watt, so WebAssembly text. OK, just kind of a brief aside. Um, the text format uses something called S expressions. If you've ever worked with Lisp or something like that, you're familiar with this concept, but it can be a little scary if you haven't. Uh, put really simply, all that S expressions are is a way to represent a hierarchical kind of tree-like data in a textual form. So on the left here, we have a WebAssembly module. And on the right, we have the tree that is produced by that module. So a module has functions. And functions have names and parameters. And parameters have names and types. And then that is being represented using these S expressions, where the first word is the root. And then you have children as subsequent items in that list, surrounded by parentheses. Enough about S expressions, though. Let's dive in and, and understand what a WASM module looks like. So, Building up from the foundation, this is the simplest thing that would compile as a WebAssembly module, just module. Uh, and that's my talk. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, so let's make it a little bit more exciting. Um, you can add functions to a WebAssembly module. So if you had like a simple Rust program with an add function and a plus one function, this is maybe what it would compile to. Let's understand a bit about the shape of that, what they look like. We've got an add function here. It takes in a left-hand side and a right-hand side parameter, returns a result. All of the types here are i32, so 32-bit integers. And it has three instructions, which I'll break down in a little bit here. Then on line six, we have a plus one function, takes in a parameter x and adds one to that value and returns that, again, 32-bit integers. And you'll note on line nine, we're calling that function we've defined above, so we can have dependencies between these functions we're defining. Here's what this looks like diagrammatically. Um, we've got our WASM module. It's got the two functions in it. There's a dependency between them. And you'll notice it's uh, living in that green box. And the green box is the runtime. So the runtime is what actually executes that WebAssembly module. Now, you're also going to notice that there's this host guest terminology. And when I first came into the WebAssembly ecosystem, I was constantly seeing host and guest terminology all over the place. And it really confused me. So I want to take a little bit of time to just break it down and simplify it. Um, the first point I want to get across is that when you see host, you should just think runtime. Just replace the word in your head. <laughs> and when you see guest, you should think the WebAssembly module. Um, it's really as simple as that, that it's just kind of this mapping. Um, and the second thing I want to share is kind of a helpful analogy, I think, to understand why we use this host guest terminology. So 
Imagine that this host runtime is like a hotel, and then the guest WASM modules are like the guests coming to that hotel. So when a guest comes to a hotel, they get access to their room, and maybe they get access to the pool, and the buffet, and maybe the gym, but the guest doesn't get access to other guests' rooms. The guest doesn't get access to the back of the kitchen or things like that. And so the host guest terminology sort of speaks to this, uh, you know, the guest being not necessarily fully trusted, whereas the host uh, is a fully trusted environment. Okay, so I said I was gonna talk about the instructions of that add function. And to talk about that, what we need to understand is that WebAssembly is encoded for a stack-based virtual machine. Uh, that can sound a little complex, a little computer science they bring you back to you, maybe your university days. Um, but it's pretty simple, and, and we'll walk through an example here. So let's imagine we're calling the add function with the parameters four and three. We've got our three instructions here. So the first one's going to run, which is local.get left-hand side. And what the local.get instruction is saying is it's saying get the value of the given parameter, in this case left-hand side, and push that value onto the stack. So we'll see the same thing happen with right-hand side, and we'll see three pushed onto the stack. Then we have i32.add. That's a binary operator, which is saying, I expect there to be two 32-bit integers on the stack. I'm gonna pop those values off the stack, and then I'm gonna add them together and push the result back on the stack. So we pop the two values off the stack, and we get the result on the stack. And then finally, given the signature of this function here, 32-bit integer result, we expect by the completion of this function that there should be one 32-bit integer, in this case seven, left on the stack, and that's what's returned. Now, of course, this is kind of a contrived, simple example of what a stack machine looks like, um, but I think it nicely illustrates how all of the instructions you would find in a WebAssembly module are defined as pushing and popping values off the stack. Now, I wanna do a brief aside on the performance of WebAssembly. So, if you were, you know, as a fun little side project to build a, a WASM runtime that executes the instructions by strictly just emulating the stack machine by pushing values onto it and popping values off of it, that would not actually be a very efficient uh, a WASM runtime. And we wouldn't get that kind of near native execution speed that we expect out of WebAssembly. So in practice, what production level runtimes are doing is they're transpiling this internal stack-based representation into some intermediate form that they prefer, and then JIT compiling that, generating machine code on the fly, um, which is much quicker, and where we get the kind of performance we talk about in WebAssembly. Awesome. So we've got a, a WASM module. It's got some functions in it. Um, it's being executed in a runtime, but we can't do anything with it. It's this black box, and you can't touch it. Thankfully, WebAssembly gives us ways to export functionality. So we've got this add function we've been working through to understand. And on line six, we can see an export clause, which is saying export to the name wasmad the internal function we've defined add. So export it with the name wasmad. Here's this in a diagram. Again, our wasm module, and we're exporting that function as wasmad, which then can be invoked by somebody using that runtime. This is how we expose the functionality out of our WebAssembly modules. WebAssembly also gives us the ability to import functionality. And I think it's important to stop for a second and ask ourselves, why would we care to import functionality? And the short answer to that is because all you can do in a WebAssembly module is really basic computation. You can add and multiply and subtract numbers. You can do conditionals, loops, jump around in functions, but you can't. Uh, talk over the network, or read or write files to the disk, or access environment vari variables, or anything like that. But you can import in functionality that lets you do those things. So in this example, we're importing in a function uh, from the console log namespace called print internally, and print takes in an integer and we'll print that to the console. Then we define our own function called print number that pushes X onto the stack and calls that print function we've imported, and so basically we're just printing whatever you pass to X. Here's what this looks like in a diagram. Uh, got the module, we're getting a function supplied by the user to the host runtime that we're importing in, and that's how we're printing out to the console. Now, there's one last concept um, I wanna talk about with regards to kind of the, the WebAssembly module, and that's this concept of shared linear memory. Now, shared linear memory is a little bit of a mouthful, so I'm gonna break it down word by word to, to really get at what it, what it means here. 
So memory. As, as programs get more complex, you have strings and objects and things that you want to represent, and you don't want to put it on the stack. You want to put it somewhere in the heap. So we need some memory. So WebAssembly gives us that memory. It's nothing more than the normal memory you used to. You can read bytes to it and uh, write bytes to it. Why do we call it linear memory, though? We call it linear memory because when a, a WebAssembly module is instantiated, we give it one linear section of memory, not disparate sections throughout the, the host computer's memory, just a single linear section of memory. And then why do we call it shared linear memory? Well, we call it shared linear memory because not only can that WebAssembly guest module itself has access to that linear memory, but you can also have the host have access to that memory. So we'll see a diagram here in a second that breaks that down. But the example we've got here is we're going to be importing a, a console log function. So we're importing from the console log namespace a function called log. Except this one takes two integers. The first integer is an index of where it should look into the memory. And then the second is a length of how many bytes it should read out from that memory. So the purpose of this function is saying, OK, look into the memory, read out x number of bytes, and print that to the console. Then on line three, and, and sorry, we're going to use that function later on to, to print out some memory, uh, print out a string we've initialized into the memory. So to initialize in the memory, first we have to import that memory. On line three, we import from the sysmem namespace one page of memory. That's what memory one means. A single page of memory in WebAssembly is 64 kilobytes. On line four, we're now uh, initializing this string that we want to print into the memory. If you've ever worked with assembly, this is kind of like a static section where you're just defining some data there. So we're saying at the index zero, that's what the i32 const zero means, stick the string hello world new line. Then we define our own internal function, hello world, push the value zero, which is the index in the memory onto the stack, push the value 14, which is how many bytes onto the stack, and then call that log function we've imported. And then, of course, export the hello world function so that somebody can actually use this thing. So that's a lot. Let's understand it in diagram form. We've got that shared linear memory. Remember how I talked about how it can be accessed both by the WASM module, but also by things in the host uh, space. And then we're initializing hello world into the memory. And then we have this kind of cycle of we import some functionality to do some work we want to do. We use that internally in functions. And then we expose those functions back out so they can be used. Now, I think this is a fantastic slide to talk about the security properties of WebAssembly. And there's a couple of things I want to get across. First thing I want to get across is the deny by default nature of WebAssembly. Um, I'm sure you guys are all very familiar with this concept. I've heard so many great security talks today. Um, but in WebAssembly, everything is denied by default. So in, in, for example, the container world, you can do whatever you want. You can read and write to the file system. You can talk over the network. Um, but as we've seen so far in WebAssembly, you very explicitly and granularly have to say, I want access to uh, you know, talk to the network. Uh, and and you, even specific ports, it can get that granular. Or I want the ability to print. And so those things can be audited, uh, whether you actually want that WASM module to have access to those things. And secondly, um, this is where the whole kind of sandboxed execution environment comes in. So if you remember that kind of whole like hotel guest analogy, um, the, you, you can also use, I guess, kind of like a kid playing in a sandbox analogy, where, where this guest WASM module is like a kid playing in the sandbox. And that could be untrusted code if you know, you're running a plugin in a browser or you're running a serverless function. And you don't know what that WASM module is going to do. But because of the guarantees built into the WebAssembly specification, we can be confident that when it's executing this WASM module, it's only going to use the things that it's explicitly imported. It's only going to be able to re access that region of linear memory. And it's never going to be able to break out of that memory and do a, a memory overflow attack on the underlying system. So that's just kind of a, a brief explainer of some of the security properties of, of WebAssembly. Um, again, this is really just the basics, kind of just peeking in to the basics of what a WebAssembly module looks like. There's a lot more. There's globals. There's dynamic function, point, uh, function pointers and things like that, um, things we don't have time for today. But if you're interested in exploring, I highly recommend the Mozilla Developer Network docs and also the WebAssembly specification itself. I know that sounds really hardcore, but I actually recommend it. The intro sections are like really readable and just skip the like 50 pages of like instructions over instructions. Um, more on this later. 
Okay, so we've cracked open the middle. We've understood what is a WebAssembly module. It's a bytecode format. We've seen a bit what that looks like. How do you actually run these things? What, what does a runtime actually do? Well, there's three semantic phases as outlined by the specification. First semantic phase is decoding. Pretty straightforward. You read the WebAssembly off the disk and you represent it as some internal representation in your runtime. The next step is validation. You validate that this internal representation of a module you have, it's valid, it's well-formed, and it conforms to the security properties we expect about it. Um, two things about this. One, it's really cool. They've designed it such that decoding and validation can be done in tandem at the same time, which allows us to do like streaming execution. Secondly, um, again, this kind of just harkens back to this, the security properties of WebAssembly, where we can be confident we're getting those, uh, you know, that sandboxed execution environment because we're making sure the, the modules we're executing are well-formed. Finally, the most important step is execution, which has two parts. You do uh, instantiation, which is instantiating a module instance, which is effectively just a bookkeeping step. Um, unless you're a compiler nerd. <laughs> and then uh, you do invocation, where you actually execute the specific function you want to, one of the functions you've exported. Since about 2017, we've had fantastic WebAssembly support in the browsers, uh, SpiderMonkey, V8, a number of projects like that. Um, but nowadays, we're seeing a lot more runtimes popping up. Um, Kind of the marquee one, a fantastic project is Wasm Time. Uh, it's what we use at Fermion, and, and a number of other companies use it too. Um, it's maintained by the Bytecode Alliance. Um, but there's really a, a plethora of, of different projects. Um, one of my pet projects that I'm just really fond of is Wasm 3, because um, they do some really cool stuff about how they interpret WebAssembly. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make here is that there's different runtimes for different use cases. And depending on what you're doing, it might make sense to use a different one. Again, just kind of hearkening back to this cross-system architecture that you get, uh, cross-system portability that you get out of WebAssembly. Now, what does it look like to compile your code to WebAssembly? What's that story look like? Well, for compiled languages, it's a reasonably straightforward story. If your language supports WebAssembly, you flip the right configuration bits and you use WebAssembly as your target instead of x86 or ARM or whatever like that. Um, Rust has some of the best WebAssembly support out there. Uh, great place to get started with that. It's what we use at Fermion for a lot of things. C and C++ also have pretty good support through projects like Mscripten, LLVM, and Zig even, even can uh, compile C to WebAssembly. What I think is a more interesting part of the story, though, is interpreted languages, because they're a little more tricky to get into WebAssembly. The reason they're more tricky to get into WebAssembly is because you can't just directly compile, for example, Python to WebAssembly, just like you couldn't directly compile Python to x86 or something like that and run it on your machine. You wouldn't know a priori what you're supposed to compile to. So what do you do to get something like Python running on WebAssembly? What you do is you take the whole Python interpreter and you spend a really long time figuring out how to get C Python to compile to WebAssembly. And then you have this massive WebAssembly module with an interpret function that you've exported. And then when you want to run your Python program, you pass that Python program as a input to that function that you're invoking on that module. And you run the Python source code through the interpreter running on the runtime. Um, so it's kind of kind of a crazy way to do it, but uh, I think it really uh, succinctly points to this kind of polyglot story that we get out of WebAssembly, where even languages that are interpreted and dynamic and have such uh, you know, different preconditions than things like C or C++ or Rust can even run on WebAssembly. Here's just a quick excerpt of the uh, WebAssembly support matrix from Fermion.com. Um, as you can see, supports great across a number of languages, and it's only getting better over time. And that brings us to the end of our talk. I just want to very quickly kind of go over two different things that directions you can go in if you're interested in uh, playing around with WebAssembly more or learning about it more. So first of all, um, I took some time to put a reading list on my personal site. At the end, there'll be a QR code here. Uh, it's got links to a bunch of stuff about like the component model and WASI and stuff that's coming down the pipe. And then secondly, if you want to get hands-on, um, I highly recommend checking out Spin. We've got a quick start guide that will get it installed. Um, it's a great way to play around with WebAssembly on the server side and, and maybe something worth checking out. But that's all for my talk, and QR codes are here. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions? Hey, great talk, thanks. Um, two questions very quickly. One, uh, I think you didn't mention WASI. So if I understand correctly, is it like when the host gives access to memory to the uh, guest? Is th this is what WASI defines, how this looks like? And the second question quickly, what's with the logo? Why does it look like Washington State? Do you know no. why? <laughs> Wait, what looks like Washington? What looks like the Washington? logo, the logo of the WebAssembly. <laughs> WA. Uh, to answer your weird. second question, I have no clue. Maybe Ralph in the back knows. That's a great question. Um, to answer your first question for WASI, so I kind of alluded to WASI. WASI stands for WebAssembly System Interface, I believe. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with like how the memory, the shared linear memory is handed to a module. Think of WASI as kind of, so remember in the examples how we were importing a console log function so you can print? Think of WASI as like a standardized way to get things like the ability to print or talk to the network or read or write files or, or do even kind of more high level cloud operations like talk to a queue, um, a standardized way of having um, those things available to your module. It's less to do with the memory allocation. But Ralph has something to add, and I highly recommend checking out the reading list. I link to blogs explaining much better than I do WASI. Um, actually, that's a pretty good explanation. I'm Ralph. Um, so uh, logo first. So that was, a, that was designed a long time ago, and it's meant to be a puzzle piece. It's supposed to be a puzzle piece. Uh. Right, you know, so, but WA, you know, I mean, it makes sense. No, that was a really good explanation of WASI. The way I think about it is as a standard for defining imports and exports mm -hmm. that is really a wrapper around the core uh, WebAssembly module. Now, there's probably a lot of details that are left in the, on the floor there in that description, but roughly speaking, that's sort of the way, the way it looks at, I, I look at it. Um, I was going to ask a question about the interpreted stuff that you were explaining, and just to ask you, so... It would seem that with an interpreted language, then you're going to do interpreting inside the module, which would make it much, much slower. But I'm assuming that there are, uh, because I know that some people have done this, and I'm assuming there are certain optimizations that make that uh, uh, less slow, that speed it up to make it uh, much more efficient. Um, do you have an explanation for kind of how that works I, so at the WebAssembly level? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I feel like there's kind of two big problems with that the interpreted language approach. The first one is that for every time you want to run your program, you're copying the whole interpreter into a WebAssembly module, and that gets really expensive size-wise, which I have an answer to. And then the issue that Ralph answered, a uh, uh, question that Ralph asked of, um, performance-wise, which, to be honest, I don't actually have a great answer for. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to talk with Joel Dice, who's a guy at Fermion doing a lot of work on, on these uh, interpreted languages in WebAssembly and talk to him about that. Um, but I can speak to, to the size one. And uh, it, there's work basically being done such that you can link in the interpreter and not have to copy that in. Um, I'm pausing because I'm getting really excited thinking about the component model and all the things that are coming that I haven't talked about yet. So go read the reading list. Um, but we're, we're working on things like uh, garbage collection built into WebAssembly to make that easier so you can do it at the WebAssembly level and not at the application level. And then also like module linking such that you don't always need to pull in the whole interpreter. But good question, Ralph. I'm gonna go talk to Joel. <laughs> Any more questions? We have one more minute. I know that most browser environments have lots of memory, lots of CPU power associated with them because of things. Um, is WebAssembly a suitable language for targeting smaller systems? Like how much RAM do you need to do Mod I, I know that's gonna that's gonna vary tremendously with the workload, but you know, for a given program, is this a yes? It fits in a gigabyte. Oh, no, you need four gigabytes. Like, what's the minimum kind of footprint that something like this has? I, I'm laughing because Ralph is losing his mind back there out of excitement. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great fit. I, I talked earlier about how WebAssembly is being in, used in these embedded, uh, embedded use cases. Um, but I mean, I just wouldn't even think about it at that scale of like, oh, you need at least four gigabytes or things like that. I feel like way, 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 way smaller and simpler things can execute WebAssembly. Because really, all you're doing, I mean, I talked about the stack-based execution being really slow, but you could write that in an afternoon to just execute some WebAssembly. Um, so 
yes, that's a long way of saying it can run on small systems, and that's a great use case for it. <laughs> Mm. The chip BIOS. Yeah. Uh, just to restate, though, Intel has uh, done demos where they've taken the WebAssembly micro runtime, and that is essentially the chip firmware, and you just deliver WebAssembly for, to, for some of the Intel chips and stuff like that. So, like, absolutely it can get small. Um, where you start talking about, like, bigger workloads, like, you can run uh, pretty good inferencing, like ML models, in very small spaces with WebAssembly, and that's really, really cool. Um, but like a big ML model, uh, kind of you know the things that we're talking about today, like that are all the rage and stuff like that, those things could be 30, 100 megabytes, 500 megabytes, just the model, or, or a lot more. So it, you know, it really is gonna depend on your workload. If you're talking about very small things, the answer is absolutely, and absolutely is a runtime, no problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we run out of time. So thank you, Caleb, once again. Thank you, everybody.